the Constitution was meant to be a philosophical slash strategic overview of how our society should be constructed. And in a lot of ways, it was, had to be divinely inspired simply because of clarity and brevity and the fact that it's lasted so long. That's an amazing thing. But I think we are drifting away from our Constitution just as quickly, the secular community, as the church is in America, has drifted away from the biblical moorings of our society. And it's because we have not taught, passed on, revered, handed down to next generations these truths that we hold to be self-evident have not been, an understanding of them has not been passed on. We are so honored to have you here again with us, uh, Bishop Harry Jackson. It's great to be with you again as we consider you one of the wisest men here in the United States. And we so uh, love to listen to you. Uh, you go in and out of the White House uh, speaking to and ministering to the leading people in this nation uh, in this time of divisiveness for America. And you hold a business degree and your education from Harvard Business School. You have been featured at the New York Times, uh, the Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, and so in so many leading media outlets here in this nation. You are an author of many books and also the senior pastor of Hope Christian Church in Maryland. And as we always like to say, first and foremost, we enjoy listening to you precisely because you are a social conservative. That means somebody that cares for humanity, that wants to look at the dire issues of minorities and the people that are oppressed and suppressed in various countries. And we are here discussing the shutdown of free speech in the West. And yes. we're here discussing how is it that America of losing the very freedoms that were so central to this nation? Well, it's an interesting question because back in the civil rights days, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., by most Americans, is esteemed as an iconic, classic American. And if you go past him, you gotta go all the way back to the revolutionary days to have people that seem to embody Americanism. But he seemed to put his case to the American public by lifting up a constitution in his left hand and a Bible in his right hand. Meaning, depending on which group he spoke with, he had to have a higher framework, um, a way of referencing truth and righteousness. And I think America is losing uh, her ability to call the nation back to accountability because we no longer really honor the Constitution or the Bible at the level that we once did. I was questioned by media, um, internal media, and they asked me, why do we have so many problems with civility in America? And I told him that it was because of what Alexis de Tocqueville said when he said that America uh, is great because America is good. And I made the comment that when the U.S. had universally Christian values, and even people who didn't choose to live the Bible studied the Bible in school, they were aware of biblical framework, they created a constitution as a derivative of truths found in the Bible, is that it was easier to unify. But any nation in the world, their laws are a combination of what 
I would call generally agreed upon moral judgments. We outlaw things that are outside the boundary of what we think are collectively, collaboratively right or wrong. That's what laws are. So we say this is illegal. Certain thing the Bible doesn't like, we don't care about. But collectively we say these truths are what we stand by. So in the Congress of the United States, in the public discourse that we live in now, it's harder for people to get anything done or to pass laws even in America because the presuppositions that we have, the fundamental truths that we base our thinking on have grown in a divergent kind of pattern. And what we need is a third great awakening in America, which would mean God pushing the reset button, people responding and going back to a biblical and or constitutional framework for our thinking and our judgments. It's so special when you look at the American Constitution. Uh, I think that is the greatest constitution in modern history pertaining to the civil liberties and rights of man. The right to, to explain your view in the newspapers, the right to bear arms in order to defend your property, yeah. uh, the right to own property. And of course, with that comes elements such as uh, responsibility the right to take responsibility for your own actions. One can go on yes. and on speaking about the American Constitution and its greatness. Well, and its greatness, as I stated, had to do with the values represented, but also the brevity, how concise and clear the, the statements were. Those documents with all this kind of truth, you could think you'd go into uh, an encyclopedia if you got into very many details. But the Constitution was meant to be a philosophical slash strategic overview of how our society should be constructed. And in a lot of ways, it was had to be divinely inspired simply because of clarity and brevity and the fact that it's lasted so long. That's an amazing thing. But I think we are drifting away from our Constitution just as quickly, the secular community, as the church has, in America has drifted away from the biblical moorings of our society and it's because we have not taught, passed on, revered, handed down to next generations these truths that we hold to be self-evident have not been, an understanding of them has not been passed on. You have spoken of the civil rights movement being yes. so much more than just black history. Because yes. today, of course, we live in a time of identity politics and everything is about uh, race or creed or whether you're a Muslim or non-Muslim or, you know, the color on somebody's skin or not and gender and all of that. Mm -hmm. But you said that Martin Luther King, rather than actually being an activist for just black lives, it was mm -hmm. really a movement of free speech, of civil disobedience and of a religious revival, as yes. many are not aware that Martin Luther King was a Christian preacher. He, he was actually a pastor of a church. Uh, he came from uh, good stock. His father was a pastor. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, his father's original name was Michael King, and he changed his name to Martin Luther a king because of his belief in Martin Luther, the great reformer of the Christian church. And so Martin Luther King Jr.'s dad felt that he was called to be a game changer, a thought changer in culture. And 
He passed that name on to his son. And I think that was a destiny move. Like in the Bible, there are many, many people who had their names changed from Abram to Abraham or from Saul to Paul. And it spoke of a change of character. So I think Martin Luther King Jr. saw from his childhood his role was to reform and change fundamental things about American thought life, about how they viewed the value of human life. And um, so free speech was at the heart of it. Uh, I talked to many of the civil rights leaders that were still alive, and they all said that they wanted to use free speech to create an opportunity where a picture would be taken or a film uh, would be taken for the news that would show America how bad racism was. And that the picture, the news clip, whatever it was, would convey how unfair America had become, how far she'd fallen from her standards. Now, I don't want to sound too religious, but they all believed that the Holy Spirit, if given the right picture, would act upon that picture, use it to bring conviction, a sense of conscience, a sense of guilt. It would be a catalyst for repentance or change that would transform American culture. And the truth is, that's exactly what happened. A minority of people, a bunch of folks who are descendants of former slaves, did regional campaigns to show up inequities. And eventually, some of those images hit folks. And the Voter Rights Act of the middle 60s and all of the laws that changed public accommodations and people's ability to be educated. All of those laws that were passed in the mid-60s were passed by a majority of white people who were empowered in political office. It was not, comparing it to South Africa of today, it was not like a South Africa where a majority black group of people uh, took power, and they finally got their power. This was a group, predominantly white nation, deciding that it had been unfair and had fallen from their, um, their values, their standards. And their act of repentance was to codify, recodify, and change the laws of the land. I think that's a modern day miracle. And then when looking at the shift and the dramatic shifts uh, from the free speech, many say that had Martin Luther King lived today, he wouldn't have lasted the, that long. <laughs> he would have been stopped long time before. It's a great worry oh. today as uh, we look at over 90% of the American mainstream media being owned only by six corporations. Uh, and we see the multinational, international business model also departing from the nation state, capitalist system, and making so many of extremely rich today. Mm -hmm. And looking at that whole system, how the mainstream media into some sort of propaganda system we do see. It seems like the situation is worsening for free speech. Well, I think you have a point there, but let's go back and analyze King for a moment. I believe King operated in what I would call three separate mantles or realms of spiritual authority. First was more the basic Christianity, which we're going to talk about revival, renewal, and awakening. America has had several awakenings. Third, second, we find that there is community organizing. President Obama was a community organizer. Uh, essentially, what happened with King was that he 
went to different places, did short, tangible um, crusades and campaigns, the last of which was in Memphis, right before he was assassinated, there was a garbage workers a strike, and the men were carrying signs saying, I am a man. Um, in other words, I'm a man, not animal. Don't treat me as I'm less than human. So there was an organizing community, and there was a point. It was almost like he said, this right here, that's immoral. Change that, okay? So then the third issue was collaborating with a national uh, legislative power and the president, the administration. So we went to the White House. Some of the things I read by King said, I quote, that the same passion that got him, that's actually a paraphrase, to the White House could get him kicked out of the White House in the next uh, season. In other words, he realized he was carrying a message. He was carrying truths from the Constitution and the Bible. And they would could be received by one administrator and administration and rejected by another. So he didn't hold fast to the idea that I have to be accepted by the president. His idea is I've got to speak truth in these three realms. That being said, what we've had is that we've had a, I think the, the, the folks who are a part of the conservative movements have stopped playing the game well in terms of how you conduct yourself in a democratic society. And we fail to realize that I believe we could have a, an awakening in America if we appeal to these three audiences. If you think about it in those three ways, it's possible to have a revival that affects America within the church that recalibrates our sense of moral boundaries, what we should be about. And in our communities, there can be activism based on the morality we espouse that could advocate for specific social change. And then thirdly, we have to be aware that any lasting change that happens in the U.S. today is going to have to be codified in our laws. So somehow, Congress and Senate and our president have got to come into some kind of agreement with we need to make these adjustments like King did, or adjustments on race, or adjustment recently we had the First Step Act on criminal justice reform. We're going to codify these things in law so that there's a more permanent um, representation of our views. I think President Trump has hit on them, has started, but we need to, his full term and intensity and passion to hit him. I think we still have problems with housing in America, and I'll come back, I'll just take off the ones, we'll see which ones you want. Housing in America needs to be dealt with from a poor versus rich point of view. I think education reform is critical. And I think criminal justice reform is also a major issue. I'd add a fourth, some we've already talked about, uh, immigration reform, how we deal with immigration. And I mean, I'm a conservative, so I'm not talking about taking a liberal point of view, but I'm saying these areas have to be restructured. Housing, the signs and symptoms of poverty seem to follow people to different communities. And repeatedly in America, when certain kinds of people, uh, I'm talking about value systems, live together, they reproduce certain predictable behaviors. We're going to have to address why is what was formerly called the ghetto, why is it possible for me to 
gentrified community in D.C. where we're doing this taping. Why can we gentrify, like bring in rich people, take over these communities, the community goes well, but the place that the poor people move to becomes a replica of what they came out of. We take them out of a poor area, move them to a richer area, and three years later, the richer area looks like the poor area they came from. What are the dynamics? We have some ideas about that, but I think those are the kinds of things that should be addressed. I talk about education reform. In America today, whites perform the best at, at the third grade level in math and in reading. Hispanics are all over the map. If they're linguistically challenged, not so well, but it's less than whites. Blacks also are very much less than whites in terms of academic performance of a third grade kid anywhere in the United States who happens to be black why is it that our neighborhood-based education is producing inferior results for kids? And then we can go into criminal justice reform and we could go into immigration. With similar questions, I think these are things we have to address as a culture or society. And on that note, I would like to thank you, Bishop uh, Harry Jackson, for joining us here and speaking about the great reformer, the Christian preacher, Martin Luther King, and the civil rights movement, and the various aspects of all this interesting uh, material. Thank you very much uh, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to joining us here at the Herland Report. Thank you for having me.